The story is not set in Berkeley. Uh, it's set uh, south of here, and you'll find out in the first sentence or the second. It's called, it's, uh, oh, and it's forthcoming in the Iowa Review, this story, in the spring. It's called Beach Bunnies. Are you a train, a crew cut boy asked me, beside a pink flamingo in 1968? It was Friday night, Laguna Beach, a motel parking lot, and around us crowds of college students wavered in pink neon light, drunk on sunburn and grain alcohol with limeade. He wore a crisp white shirt and narrow tie, while I had baby cheeks and a ribbon tying back my hair in a yellow cotton sundress my mother had made. Does anyone ever say yes to that, I wanted to ask? since what he meant was, would you care to get in bed with 50 of my friends? But he was probably a senior, president of his fraternity, and I had learned to treat my elders with great and silent courtesy, a form of evasion that had worked well for me so far. You surf, right, he said, as if that ought to clinch the deal. I giggled like it was a joke. Sure, there I was, as drunk as anyone, and not a virgin, no. And yeah, I tried to surf, though as far as I knew, it had less to do with wild sex than with broken teeth. That was one reason I loved it, how it yanked me out of the safe world where I, where I grew up and meant I couldn't turn into my mother now. So did flunking out of school, and I was looking into that, cutting class enough to make my GPA a solid D. A boy's dorm had generously nominated me for Playmate of the Month, and I thought that sounded like the chance to get a guarantee. In other words, if anyone was likely to get into trouble here, it would be me. But my friend Viv had overheard. Viv knew what was what. She was a real beach girl, dolled up in a waist cinch, girdle, push-up bra, red bandeau and black capris, red toenails, high-heeled sandals. A lustrous brunette, she was coiffed, made up, and perfumed like a deep south belle, gilded with bracelets and serpentine gold chains. She had grown up right here, and she knew why the guy ignored her and chose me as if the flat-haired, flat-sandaled, relatively flat-chested girl might consider it worthwhile to pull down her Wednesday underpants for a fraternity. You weenie, straight off Adolf, she vigorously called him, stinging insults in a surfing town. Do you even know which side the boards waxed on? Unperturbed, he moved on to the next group of girls, one of whom leaned over to barf up her limeade. Exit stage left, Viv said, and did a graceful plie to stub her cigarette on asphalt, since ladies did not smoke and walk at the same time. Betty was a virgin, wouldn't have a clue what to do. Jesus, how did you get so smoked? Briskly, she tugged me up the empty coast highway, lit only by a full moon rising like a giant flashlight from behind the coastal hills, and I was drunk enough I could see two of them. I clowned a little, pretended to stagger, trying to make her laugh. Viv and I weren't natural friends. She was an old friend of Candy, my roommate, and she let us spend weekends at her place to surf and soak up rays. Only tonight, Candy was out with her philosophy TA, planning to offload her virginity. And here was Viv, sh showing me a good time anyway. Viv was 19, a year ahead of me, but she'd skipped college, worked as a secretary, and still went to high school football games. In a few decades, she might become the one most indispensable person in a large office, wearing cat's eye rhinestone bifocals on a long chain. This, that was not exactly my life plan, though I was working as a typist, too, on work study, 
and I had yet to prove I'd stay in school. I made an effort. So, Viv, you still seeing that guy? What's his name? The cruel Italian? He was one of three we knew of. The other two we called Magic Fingers and Mr. Spaz. In response, she startled me by crooking an arm around my neck and rubbing knuckles on my scalp, like we were guys and me the kid brother. You, drunk girl, got your cottontail yet? She laughed like this was hysterical, though it was not the playmates who wore bunny tails or much of anything except their tans. It was the bunnies in the Playboy Club who had to carry trays while wearing rabbit ears, skimpy bathing suits with fluffy tails and four-inch heels. I laughed politely and missed Candy. Candy made us feel good when she walked between us, like she needed us, a phalanx of protection on each side. Her real name was Lillian, but she had ditched it early on, and she was a wonder of nature, like Marilyn Monroe. Leggy, big-eyed, honey blonde, with narrow hips and double D-cup breasts. At school, she hid herself in choir girl skirts, white blouses and conservative black heels. But on the beach, when she had her bikini on, guys took one look at her and clutched their hearts. She had the whole MM thing down. She didn't walk, she minced, paused to giggle each few steps. She spoke in breathy whispers. Everything she said was half a joke and sweet. Ooh, you're so good at that, she said when I helped her with her math. How did you get such a big brain into that little head? <laughs> I'd flunk right out if it weren't for you. But she wasn't only sweet. In private, she had lots to say about stuck-up people, catty girls, teachers who thought they were God. She loved four-letter words and bent them every way she could. She would purse her bee-stung lips, show a few small teeth, and say, Grr, this f***ing day so sucks. I'm going to kick its slutty butt. Her philosophy TA was cute enough and 24, and Candy had picked him since he sometimes actually met her eyes and not her chest. I wasn't so sure. Everyone called him Slotkin, his last name. And his idea of a conversation was to pick apart whatever you said, like he was naturally your teacher, even on the beach. He was from Brooklyn via Harvard, with tight black curly hair and skeptical small eyes, and he played chess for a good time. He and Candy just looked wrong, and I didn't like her awe of him. I had felt the same for Gray, my first lover, also 24 and just as supercilious and he had dumped me when I made the number one beginner's error, falling soggily in love. I supposed I wanted Candy to go through that too and join me there. I hadn't actually tried to talk her out of it. Viv paused in the moonlight and checked her rhinestone watch. Jesus, if you weren't so wrecked, I'd say we ought to cruise that USC party. Maybe we should get back in case she calls, I slurred, in case she she needs us to come get her or something. Viv laughed and grabbed my head again, rubbed harder. What do you think's going to happen, girlie? Gidget, that's what we should call you. Gidget goes to college. There's nothing to worry about. Cherries are made to pop. She'll be all right. And if she isn't, we'll put sand in his gas tank. Come on, let's get you some coffee. Nothing was open this time of night, but across the highway, a red neon sign said, Cottages, Color TV, two times, one above the other, quivering. The place had a Coke machine, and Viv chunk in, chunked in our change to get me a cold can and stood by while I drank it down. As soon as I felt the caffeine sugar buzz, I went euphoric, happy to be there with Viv. Viv knew stuff I would never learn, like how to sleep around and never fall in love. She often lectured me in candy about deathless and essential things. One time it was herbs, sprinkled onto dime-sized hamburgers for us to taste. Another night it was the secret of the orgasm. The chick comes after the guy, she had explained. When he goes a little soft, that's when it feels the best. It gets better and better till you feel this sort of pulsing, like when he comes, only more so, because it's you. To demonstrate, she had rhythmically opened and closed her fingertips and even supplied sound effects, sort of like doop, doop, doop. 
She said most guys had one woman who got away and she would always be the one for them. The rest just sex and getting their meals cooked. You had to pretend you didn't care if you wanted to be a guy's true love. Men needed sex like women needed air, but they still found it a great mystery, and they weren't born knowing what to do. One fellow had simply stuck himself inside of her and held still. Poor guy, he just lay there till he couldn't stand it anymore, Viv said, and Candy and I had laughed so hard we wept, though we were at least as clueless as that guy. <clears throat> The USC party was nothing but a lot of football players jostling in strobe lights, leering into Viv's bandeau. One guy dropped onto his knees and ran huge meaty hands up my bare thighs under the dress while he sang, little surfer, little one, before I jumped away. Clearly it was too late for civilized discourse, and having taken on a load of sour keg beer, I could hardly stand. The party happened to be near Gray's house, and when we left, I subtly steered Viv that way. I had not been there for months, and though I couldn't go 10 seconds without thinking about him, though I couldn't go 10 seconds without thinking about him, his street was mostly sand, with scraggly lawns and rhododendron bushes big as school buses, hibiscus with red stamens popped out, flaunting in the dark. Cottages sagged under heaps of jasmine and rubbery purple passion flowers. Every yard had trees loaded with oranges, grapefruits, grape, grapefruits big as cantaloupes, avocados dropping to the ground. The flower smell almost asphyxiated you, mixed with the salty air and fallen fruit that rotted all day in the sun. Gray's house lay low and white, styled for the tropics with a covered porch around one side. Yellow lights shone out from every room, his silver bathtub Porsche parked on the lawn, in duplicate unless I closed one eye. French doors open, cool jazz blowing out, and as we passed, I memorized the sight. Every detail of his life still tortured me. He was a laser engineer who had gone to the Sorbonne, spoke fluent French, surfed like he walked on water all the time. He made me speak in my bad high school French and alerted me to my provincial upbringing, which showed in how often I smiled, the way I cooked. One night, I started to toss the salad before we sat down, and he had boomed, Défense de toucher la salade avant le dîner! Don't touch the salad before dinner! With such exasperation, I should have been relieved when he was gone. Tonight, he wasn't visible, but a girl walked into his living room and lit a cigarette. She was light-limbed, graceful, tan, with lithe muscles and no major breasts, blonde hair gleaming long and free like spun sugar down her back. She was barefoot in nothing but a flowered sarong, half slipped off, like a sea, sea nymph unused to clothes. She looked like something new on earth, something I wanted instantly to be. But I had to keep on in the dark, waiting for Viv's clanking heels, her clinking gold chains. We crossed the highway to a dirt street along the rumbling cliff, crumbling cliff, where Viv had a small place in the back of an old house. But she had lost the key, and someone had to climb the loquat tree and shimmy in the bathroom window. I was smallest, so the job usually fell to me. Watch out for the bubble bath, Viv said, and shoved me up onto a gritty branch, dusty leaves rattling like armor. Feet first, I wiggled in the tiny window, landed in the clawfoot tub. It was too early yet for bed, and I sat at the table reading the same sentence of French homework over and over. Who was that fucking girl in the sarong? That girl fucking Trey Gray. <laughs> Viv removed her nail polish, painted it fresh, flipped open a magazine, and smoked three cigarettes, making my stomach almost keel. Obviously bored with me, she put on pink baby doll pajamas and wound her hair in prickly metal rollers that would dig into her scalp all night. She yawned. Guess I'll rack out. You better, too, and sleep it off. The place had just one bedroom, and I had staked out the splintery old porch to spread my sleeping bag beside my board. As soon as I was out there, ocean air revived me like an oxygen mask, and right away I thought of sneaking back to Gray's. But something told me I might not look too good to him right then. I put on my sleep t-shirt and lay down in my thin bag. 
Pretend you don't care. Was it too late for that? And now, whoa, I was on a tilt-a-whirl, tilt-a-whirl, shadows spinning. I fought off the urge to barf, knowing it would wreck my mouth and mean I couldn't go to graze, an option I still wanted for when the spinning stopped. Eyes closed, I started to dream of monster waves that swallowed towns. But I thought I was awake when I felt a gentle shake. Honey, I know it sucks, but could you wake up? said a breathy voice beside my ear. Candy knelt beside me with her skirt hitched up, sprayed hair mashed and mascara streaked like black icicles down her cheeks. And suddenly she looked to me like someone from the Eisenhower days. Immediately guilty, I saw she was holding something up between her legs. Look at this, she whispered and pulled it out, a white hand towel soaked with black. I can't stop fucking bleeding. Did you bleed like this? Thick drops fell onto the porch. No way, about a teaspoonful. I grabbed a t-shirt from my duffel bag. Here, that's not your period, right? No, God, this fucking sucks. I got back into my sundress. Neither of us had a car, and the only hospital was 10 miles away in Newport Beach. My mind moved like sludge. We'll either have to wake up Viv or use her car. Candy's face looked whiter than the moonlight. Don't wake her up. She'll kick my butt. I'll be okay. She checked the t-shirt, already turning black. No, you won't, I pointed out. Press that on there tight. Fear gave me x-ray vision as I found Viv's purse in the dark kitchen, inched out the keys to her old Impala, entered a new phase in my life of crime. I still saw mostly double all the way and had to keep one eye shut. This stretch of coast was part of a ranch the size of South Texas, home to eagles, mountain lions, longhorn steers, guys in gaucho pants, and it got dark here like the inside of a rock. Our college lay a few miles out in the coyote brush, and in my days with Gray, the infirmary had sent me to the hospital in Newport for a bladder infection. Honeymoon cystitis, the doctor had called it. <clears throat> so I knew where it was, on a hill above the arbor, and when we got there, I helped Candy walk into the bright, big, bright waiting room. Embarrassed, she had left the t-shirt in the car, and when we reached the clean linoleum, red drips the size of poker chips splashed onto it. A, a starched nurse met, met us and whispered, I take it we're having a problem down there? <laughs> she pulled Candy to a merely curtained enclosure where she had to take off all her clothes, put on a thin blue gown, and lie down with her knees spread wide. A tall, white blonde man of maybe 26 stepped through the curtains, shining clean as if he'd never seen a drop of blood. He cast cool eyes between her legs, where m no man had looked before tonight. Did he use instruments, he asked, too loud. Instruments, Candy breathed. Of course not, I snapped, voice of wisdom. The man slid a stool up to her crotch, picked up a circular needle big enough for weaving tapestry, and poked thread through its eye. Yes, instruments. Anything metal or wood? No, Candy said, and stiffened as he pried her open with the silver speculum and gave its dial a jaunty twirl. His hand dove at her with the needle, and her pale eyes filled. The doctor must have smelled the booze on me, but he smiled with brilliant straight white teeth suitable for a movie star. Please wait outside. Candy gripped my arm, started to gasp. When I did not move, he executed a swift jab and tug, still looking mostly at me, like he stitched up sex wounds every night, and he could do it carefully or fast and mean, my choice. I fought my way out through the curtains and did not look back. <clears throat> Candy was still crying back at Viv's, where I had left the door unlocked, neither of us now in any shape for climbing trees. Trying not to wake up Viv, I creaked the sofa bed open and brought Candy a box of tissues, aspirin, and a cold bud for the pain. She was too caught up in crying to drink, and I cried too, and drank the bud for consolation as I sat beside her on the bed. What did Slotkin do, I whispered. Anything weird? Her tears were slowing down, and she blew her nose. 
No, he was really sweet, but God, it fucking hurt so much. It kicked my butt. Did you hurt like that with Gray? Yeah, it hurt, but not that much. Are you sure he didn't do anything weird? I dropped my voice, trying to make her smile. You know, instruments. She gave me a sweet look. You take care of me, don't you, honey? But it's just my dumb luck to figure out a way to fuck up a romantic night, gushing blood all over the guy's sheets. It freaked him out. I had to pretend it had stopped and get him to bring me back here. I'm sorry I had to wake you up. I know that really sucks. No being sorry about anything, okay? I said. She nodded, sighed, burrowed under the covers. I stayed until I knew she was asleep, and when I crept back to the porch, the dew was down, the night air cool. I knew I ought to sleep so I could paddle out before the afternoon wind wrecked the waves. But I felt almost sober, and it was no use pretending I didn't want to go to Gray's. I brushed my teeth, put on the almost white lipstick we all wore that spring, and set off barefoot, carrying the full slopping bowl of my heart. His place was still lit up like a cruise ship on a dark ocean, and the girl in the sarong sat on the couch while Gray knelt by the coffee table, rolling a joint. His silky blonde hair draped across his forehead, his body light and fine with muscles like axe blades. Barefoot in chinos, perched on his heels, toes cocked against the floor, ready to spring. He heard my step and turned. What have you got to lose? I thought, just like I did each time I dropped into some terrifying wave. I climbed the porch stairs to his living room. He gave me a deep, unsmiling look that seemed to pull me in his arms. Ah, ma petite. I staggered frankly to the couch and threw myself down in the nearest corner, propped up with my elbow on the side rest. Bonsoir, mon cher, I said and noticed tears were streaming down my cheeks, eager to abandon ship, though I thought I felt pretty good. His eyes sparkled as he answered me in French. Your accent has improved, good little student. He lit the joint and handed it to me. Be careful, it's stronger than you're used to. But I was used to nothing yet, so I grinned and took it, inhaled heartily. The girl slowly turned her head to watch. Up close, she looked dewy fresh, and now I knew exactly who she was. Jennifer Stollybrass, also a freshman at my college. This explained many things. Her father was a U.S. senator, and she had brought her horse, rode bareback, naked, some said, on the beach. She had surfed since childhood, got straight A's while never studying, and was often spotted leaving campus with the entire starting lineup of the basketball team in her English racing green convertible. Whatever she did, she did casually, not competing, merely winning in advance. I would have left me too for Jennifer Stollybrass. She turned back to Gray, bored but with a perfect accent. She spoke French. Quel cauchemar, get her out of here. She's all right here, he said, the one documented time he was ever truly nice to me. My buzz came back with an elated rush, grain, alcohol, and bud, and dope, Wow, I thought, I love these two exquisite people. <laughs> Gray and Jennifer and all their doppelgangers, I could see. I wanted them to be together. Yes, better than love, better than jealousy. It felt like art to help them get together perfectly. When Gray left the room to get us all something to drink, I closed one eye to narrow, narrow down the Jennifers. My lips felt rubbery. Don't. Touch the salad before dinner, I said with great urgency. Put my forehead on my arm just for a rest, and that's the last thing I remember of that night. I'm just going to get a little drink of water. Let us look away from the events of the next day. Suffice it to say, I learned grain alcohol is not the nightcap of champions. And when you vomit in the ocean, even fish will swim away. <laughs> oh, doll baby, Candy murmured and held my hair back every time I hurled. She put ice packs on my head, like she was not the one with stitches in a tender spot. When she wasn't helping me, she sat right beside the phone, cigarette in hand, waving smoke away from me. Viv got tired of us and went out with the cruel Italian. And I got so bored, I did homework. <clears throat> 
By Sunday afternoon, I felt okay, and the three of us got into our bikinis and strolled north along the public beaches. It was hot, the sand packed, and we pretended to ignore the eyes that tracked us as we strutted, almost naked, three abreast along the water's edge, where the sand was slicked with a gold sheen. Steam bath air hinted at flying fish with fins like rainbow scarves, producers' million-dollar yachts bringing big contracts and true love. We kept going past the parbroiled families, transistor radios, and leathery old men with metal detectors retrieving dimes and quarters. Hoping to be discovered and whisked straight to Hollywood, we kept our eyes fixed on some distant spot, giving us true filmic intensity. Back at school, Slotkin did not call, and by Tuesday, Candy seeped tears all day. You could almost miss the way her eyes, her gray eyes misted over and left snail trails down her cheeks. I worked overtime to cheer her up. I pulled the screws from a glass wall in our dorm suite and slid it open after curfew. And we hitched to Denny's for, for banana splits or to the all-night student lounge where gray burgers sealed in crinkly wrap rotated behind glass, ready to be popped in something called the revolutionary radar oven cooks by agitating molecules. Out in the moonlight in dry chaparral, we smoked cigarettes and listened to coyotes yelp. On Friday, Viv came for us, showed us how to make lasagna, took us to see the Pink Panther, bought us junior mints. On, Sunday, on Saturday and Sunday, they sunbathed while I surfed. But still Slotkin did not call. And if anyone, said, if anyone said virgin, lover, blood, or bed, words we found hard to do without, Candy might start to cry, soaking her cigarettes. Look, girl, Viv said to Candy when she dropped us at the dorm on Sunday night, he's just chicken. Give him another week or two. Let him see how little you need him. Sometimes they can only hear you when you whisper, you know? And be sure to look like dynamite. Now you two stay out of trouble for a while, okay? A few mornings later, it was hot by dawn. The dorm had only one TV, a boxy number out in the main living room, tuned always to news, since two of our dorm mates had brothers in Vietnam. And when the weatherman came on, he said the surf was coming up. Instantly, I punted English class and got into my bikini, cotton dress over it, brushed my hair out long and free, close as I could get to Jennifer Stolly Brass. I caught a ride in the back of a rusted pickup, lawnmower rattling beside me, three Latino guys with hats pulled low in front. The hot, dry air was clear and sweet, live oaks vibrant on a, in arroyos on the ranch. As we dropped into one, I saw a crowd of men on horseback, about 50 beefy guys dwarfing their mounts in chaps, stetsons, and silver spurs, like every rancher in the state had come to help round up. Altogether, they loped up a grassy hill before we dove down a canyon toward the beach. They let me off at Viv's, and I retrieved my board, hoisted it to the flat spot on my head, and walked the short blocks to Thalia Street. Through palms along the cliff, I could see big turquoise swells making for land, and my, my heart pressed up into my neck and ears. I was afraid of waves, because I knew them, and they had hurt me. Around here, they got big as cliffs, and they could charge at you, crash on your head, and suck you down. And then there were the guys. Each beach had its own pack, and they would ride straight at you till you flinched. You almost couldn't blame them with the greater LA basin trying to get in the surf. Stinking weenie off our beach, a guy had shouted my first day here, rammed my board, and cut a wedge out with his fin, big as a shark bite. Today it was still early, no one, but, no one out but a brown pelican that dove through gold sunlight, and houses on the cliff could watch as I peeled off the dress and knelt to wax the board, stalling. A red biplane droned overhead against blue sky. In air so clear, I could see people leaning out to look straight down at me, engine reverberating with a thrum you couldn't hear on cloudy days. I checked the waves for a safe way in, Thalia broke mostly to the right, and since, like most right-handers, I stood on the board with, one left, with left foot forward facing right, 
Turning left felt like a blind backflip. So of course I practiced rights about a million times more often than lefts. A car door slammed on the clifftop, followed by young male laughs. Damn, didn't anyone have school today? I couldn't let them beat me, beat me in, and I dashed into the cold water. Knee paddling was something I could handle, and I pawed, pawed out through the break, each wave slapping intensely salty water up my nose. When I made it to the takeoff point and turned, brown, hard-bodied boys were trotting toward the surf, each with a board casually tucked under his arm, like it had grown out of his ribs. A blue ridge sprang up behind me, and I started to paddle too late. It merely lifted me and dropped me as it rolled toward shore. Damn, I was a weenie, destined to remain so all my life. But here came another, bigger than the first. I flopped on my belly, dug in with my arms. Come on, what have you got to lose? What can it do to you? It lifted me lightly, pointed the board's nose toward the sea floor, but I popped to my feet and dropped in, angled right, and stood for a few seconds like I knew what I was doing. A small boy started paddling in front of me, grimacing. She yelled. I aimed at him and showed my teeth. Back off, weenie, it's mine, back off. He hesitated for one crucial second, and I shot by him, amazed that it had worked. Maybe just because we were so far inside, he knew I was about to eat it in, in the shore break. Sickening to see the wave stretch taller, steeper, feathered all along the top and tumbled over toward me like an avalanche. When I tried to pull out, its heavy white lip caught my board. Over the falls I went, backwards, to the bottom. It held me down, still down, still down underneath. Somehow, I didn't drown, my neck intact, and my head popped out awash in white water. A girl was coming down the cliff path, bored under her arm, casual and winning in advance, long, bright hair free. I'd rarely seen another girl surf, and I knew it must be Jennifer. Guys would have gone to work, Gray would have gone to work, and left her the here to surf. Flinging myself onto the board, I paddled out fast, embarrassed to think what I might have blabbed out drunkenly that night at Gray's. In a wisp of dreamlike memory, I caught a glimpse of vomiting off a white porch, protracted slurred speeches, torrential tears, my head hung over the side of an English racing green convertible. But she paddled out toward me, but as she paddled out toward me, her eyes stayed blank, not deigning to notice me. Pretending not to see her either, I stroked for a small wave, which shrugged me off. And now a big new set came rolling toward us. Instinct made me claw out farther to survive, but the first wave almost creamed me anyway. Jennifer caught it, dropped in smooth, and from the back I could see nothing but her head and shoulders smoothly turning, gliding right till she popped out, all of her visible again. Her hair still looked dry. Relieved to be so far outside, I felt something tug me up and turned to see a huge steep wall already straight above me, too late to paddle over it. I couldn't help it, I was sliding down the front. Reaching for a sky hook as my feet went under me, I lurched upright, trying to get farther from the water so it wouldn't suck me down. My right foot in the back took all my weight, trying to stabilize the board, and I noticed I had somehow whipped it in a right turn toward the crest, almost over the top, in panic, I turned down, slid faster to the right and up too high, turned down again and up too high. Scrambling to stay alive, I flashed past Jennifer, just missing her. The beach was fast, fast approaching and the wave rose straight up, about to smash on shore. I took a breath to save myself, but it held up. No, wait, shouldn't it break? Doing about 50 miles per hour, I careened farther south than I had ever made it yet. Laughing with disbelief, I zipped over the top as it broke behind me with a roar like a train wreck. Out of danger, I blooped off like the spell was gone and clipped my lip against the hard shell of the board. Blood tasted creamy after salt water, and I was filled with longing and regret. For now I knew I had been granted a divine ripple, brief phenomenon of glory, wrinkle on God's forehead, sent from a typhoon in Tahiti to rescue me just once from weeniehood.
What it meant, though, was an offshore wind, my first Santana. When the ocean breeze got shoved back out to sea by blasts of desert air, by afternoon it was 113 degrees, blusters bending trees and whisking lunch bags out to sea. Where ocean met sky, instead of a clean line, a brown cloud lay like mustard gas, inland smog that passed right through my lungs on its way west. My alveoli felt like they'd been scrubbed with a wire brush. My body tried to cough them out. I had to drag the board back up to Viv's and lie on her lawn, gasping. Back at the dorm that night, the Santa Ana nudged out Vietnam in news with warnings about dehydration, flying trailer rigs, and empty guns that killed people. Apparently, hot wind could change the ions in the air, increase the urge to strangle your loved ones. Near Disneyland, an old couple had taken down their gun collection and let death part them, while in Costa Mesa, a young mother burned inside a trailer soaked with kerosene. And when I cruised into the room we shared, I saw a blonde heap on Candy's pillow, her back under the sheet shaking. I touched her shoulder. Hey, what gives? She bawled something that's, that sounded like, fucking no, fucking sucks. I didn't really need details. Who cared what Slotkin said? Maybe nothing. Nothing would have been enough. I could see her standing near him, books pressed to her breasts, while he feigned concentration on another student's question and walked away. I pried the pillow from her face. Hey, you're hi you'll hyperventilate. I found her cigarettes, lit one, helped her sit up, and put it between her lips. You're not bleeding, are you? Her gray eyes were mournful, white showing under the irises, but she shook her head. Let me guess, you tried whispering. I knew this was a jab at Viv for being Candy's oldest friend, but I didn't stop. Of course you looked like dynamite, but he could not hear you. Her voice was a squeak. How could he do that? He said he loved me. Yeah, he probably believed it too that night, but it doesn't mean the same to them. Her face crumpled again. Then what the f***? That night it was way too hot to sleep, even with the cheesy aluminum window shoved open all the way, but she crashed asleep like a death wish. I lay naked on top of the sheet, sweat evaporating as it hit my skin. At dawn, it was already 100 degrees. Candy didn't lift her head, and she was starting to smell sour like she had not bathed. I called Viv on the sweet phone. This is an emergency. Viv came to get her exuding efficiency. Why didn't you call me sooner? Christ, see if you can get the notes for her classes, OK? No use both of you flunking out. So all that week, I went to Candy's classes, plus my own, plus work typing letters in the anatomy department. And when Friday came, I was ready for a break. But Viv did not come to get me. I was too proud to call and hint around, and I told myself I didn't mind. I had a paper due in French on L'Etranger, uh, Camus, the stranger, to explain why Mersol kills the Arab on the beach, something I had wondered myself. His mother has just died, but he doesn't seem to care, and on the beach, the sun is too hot and bright. He sees cool blue waves, but he can't reach them. He has a gun in his pocket, and he's, when he sees the Arab, he takes it out and shoots. How was I supposed to know why? In French, I was lucky just to get the basics. Frenchman, gun, Arab, beach. I was a person who understood the funny papers really well. Mersault est, est trop chaud. Mersault is too hot, I wrote in my sincere backhanded script in fountain pen, peacock blue ink. After a while, as I sat at my ugly modern desk, a girl and two guys strolled across the lawn outside, looking cool and relaxed. I watched with dull envy, registering that the girl was Jennifer in a rumpled green plaid shift and wispy flat sandals. But wait. Who were those guys? They looked like Ron Scott and John Devereaux, world-class surfers from Laguna. Gray was a good surfer, but no way he was in their league. And I saw him shriveled, wizened in his Porsche. Her English racing green convertible stood parked on the grass like they had just popped by for her toothbrush, and they got in and drove away. I pulled out my box of surfer magazines and gazed at all those tan guys floating above blue waves defying gravity. Skip Fry, Don Takayama, Butch Van Artstellen, Mickey Munoz, Mickey Dora the Cat, 
Ron Scott and John Devereaux. I had seen the two of them before at an Italian place on the south side of Laguna where Gray took me. They had strolled in together wearing glasses, looking cute but thoughtful, intellectual, despite their muscles and the surf knots on their knees. Would they, would they ride horses on the beach with Jennifer or drive to Mexico? It was only 90 miles away, and dollars bought so much there, Gray and I had stayed once in a four-star hotel and scarfed big lobsters, margaritas, papayas, chocolate, flan, and surfed in warm water so clear you could make out yellow stripes and red dots on small green fish below. Next morning was the hottest yet, and Candy was still not back. I put on my coolest shift, an apricot gingham number I had made myself badly, a white eyelet ruffle around the boat neck. Slumped in a cafeteria booth, toying with a waffle, I tried to finish Portrait of a Lady for American Lit. But, it, but I was lonely and depressed, and the paragraphs were all too long, minutely dissecting the lady, like she was a form of insect life the author hoped might be named after him. Suddenly, I was aware of someone standing next to me. It was Jennifer Stollybrass, with Scott and Devereaux behind her, like they were never far out of her company. I was sure they must be walking past somewhere far more interesting. But she tipped up the cover of my book and said dreamily, she seemed young and innocent and not to understand what they meant when they talked. She had a great desire for knowledge, but she really preferred almost any source of information to the printed page. She had an immense curiosity about life and was constantly staring and wondering. I wondered if she had the rest of Henry James inside her brain. She waved a backhand toward the men, not bothering to introduce them. We were wondering if you'd like to join us for some tandem work at Dana Point. Bruce Brown wants to film us, and we need another girl. Bruce Brown wants to film us. Maker of the best surf movies, he had launched a thousand boards. But Dana Point was big, fast, difficult. I had gone there once and gotten creamed. In panic, I gestured at the book. Can't. Homework. She lifted graceful, light brown brows. Really? Tant pis. When they were gone, I put my head down on the Formica tabletop. How could I be such a weenie when I could go out on the same board with a possible world champion? Leaping up, still clutching Henry James, I burst out into hot sunlight, expecting to see the green convertible far off in a cloud of dust. But it was parked beside the loading dock, and they all looked up like they knew I would change my mind. I clambered down the grassy bank, and Scott helped me into the back with him before we zoomed away. We stopped at a beach house, the kind of place that rented by the week, with durable tweed couches, piney disinfected smells, green glass floats in nets around the walls. Jennifer lent me a vestigial bikini, nothing but triangles on strings, told me to call her Jen, and that I'd surf with Scott while she went with Devereaux. No surprise, since I had seen how his eyes tracked her, though Scott seemed magnetized as well. Scott was the less attractive of the two, his body square and blocky, all in shades of brown, while Dev was linear and bony, fair-skinned with straight black hair and blue eyes that tended to get shot with red when he regarded Jen. The guys stripped down to baggies and hoisted big, wide, heavy, wooden tandem boards, unlike the lightweight foam and fiberglass we used alone. Easily, they lugged them down a sandy path, and Scott spoke to me in a soft voice. We'll try a few moves first on land, okay? Nothing fancy. It isn't hard. I'll show you. I tried to act casual as we threaded through the Sunday crowd, surfers strutting as they shook water from their ears. This beach was just a narrow strip below the coast highway, and people didn't come to lie around. They came to surf, and heads turned as we went by. In a clear space, Dev lifted Jen onto his knee, facing away from him. Her suit hid little but her pubic hair, which was no doubt blonde and gleaming. Every other inch of her was smooth, brown, lean, as she tipped forward in an arabesque, one leg raised behind and arms curved out in front, Dev's hands at her waist. He helped her to his shoulders, and she stood like she was light as Tinkerbell and did another arabesque while he anchored her other calf. 
Taking hold of both his hands, she slid smoothly down in his embrace, his nose grazing her bare spine, ass to neck. It's easy, it's just balance, Scott said, and lifted me onto his knee, solid as wood. When I felt his fingers at my naked waist, I flinched. At least I did have balance. It was all I had as a surfer. And I had done ballet as a kid, so I could do the arabesque, at least on land. His, hand, his head butted between my legs from behind, emerged like I was giving birth to him. He straightened up and lifted me, holding my hands. Now stand up, lean on my hands. I put my feet on his shoulders and wobbled upright, seeing why they had given the beginner to the guy who felt like an oak stump. When he let go of my hands and braced my calves, I felt the urge to fall and get it over with. Far below me, Jen held out her arms to show me how, and I did it, mouth-breathing in fear. There was no way I could do it on one leg. <clears throat> Dryly, she said, now close your mouth and put one leg back. <laughs> But I was already falling, and Scott caught me. We did it again, about 20 times, until I actually did put one leg back shakily. That time, he spun me so his lips brushed up my front navel to collarbone, and I thought I felt a tip of tongue. Goosebumps tightened my skin. Okay, said Jen, you'll do. The whole beach watched as we, fo as we followed her into the shining sea. Scott steadied the board and got on behind me, both of us on our knees, his nose an inch above my derriere. The board was so wide, my arms barely reached the water, but his plowed us over slapping crests. The farther out we went, the bigger the waves looked. Scott didn't let me dwell on it. In one smooth move, he turned us toward shore and caught a tall, hissing comber, cold turquoise. Now there's no hurry, he said, over the shushing, just stand up. I did, trembling, and he took hold of my waist. Just stay in balance, nothing fancy. He whooshed us through some gentle turns, got us in the right part of the wave, which tamely let him use it. Picking me up, he set my feet on, onto his knee. Okay now, just relax. It felt like I had everything to lose. Afraid to turn my head, I saw Jen ahead of us, her arabesque on Devereaux's shoulders, modulating gracefully into an actual handstand. What I had done was nothing. I stood tall and tentatively probed one foot back under his arm while he leaned me out over the nose, Then he stuck his head between my legs and lifted me. I yelled in panic, I can't stand up! Sure you can, put both hands on my head and push. I'll hold your calves. Panting, I wobbled up. Blue water, gold sand, green hills swept toward me from what seemed like the cruising altitude of a small plain. Were seagulls scared? Could I do this? When we reached the shore break, Scott raised his hands to help me down, and giddy now, I giggled as he ran his tongue all up my front and flicked it in my ear. We worked for hours. Scott could keep that huge board steady as a floor while we streaked 40 miles an hour and hold me on his shoulders all the while. Soon I had my own style, pitched forward with a solemn expression and arms swept back like the hood ornament of a Rolls Royce. When Jen saw that, she gave me a few slow, ironic claps. When we finally quit, my legs shook, and I was bone cold. Back at the house, the guys put on shirts, and Jen and I wrapped in towels. The sun on the deck felt good, as we watched lesser mortals surf below and drank cold bud from sweating cans. The first went fast. Scott lifted his can to me. <clears throat> She's as bold as you are, Stally Brass. Watch out. I'm watching, Dev said, and even Jen raised her can to me, though if her lips gave a suggestion of a smile, it did not reach her eyes. Dev leaned toward me, put his arms on the table. We're sick of hung up people, you know? Spontaneous, that's what we need to be. Live like the ancient Greeks. They knew the universe flowed like a wave or an electric current. You can try to stop it, but it's going to kill you. You have to go with it. Then it'll give you all the power there is. Yeah, I said, based on my vast knowledge from two quarters of Western Civ. They thought every living thing had a god inside, even you. And you had to get out of its way. Scott laughed and put his big hand on my head. Listen to her. 
Scott fetched a round of Dos Equis in brown bottles, and they schemed new moves, betting they could teach me something called the loop-de-loop. Jen sat peeling the label off her bottle, and I was surprised to see her fingernails bitten to the quick, leaving raw pads. The breeze must have chilled me because I started to shiver, and Scott reached over, rubbed my arms. It seemed all right to lean against the big, warm body that had held me all day. Dev pointed at me. See? Completely natural. She's like you, Jen. High on the praise, I let Scott stick his tongue into my ear. Dev stood and walked around the table holding out his hands. Gimme. He leaned down and kissed me. Jen dropped her towel and displayed her perfect body as she leaned across the table to kiss Scott. Dev picked me up like a baby. I have an idea. A spontaneous idea. <clears throat> Jen looked up at us. Duty first, then pleasure. Tandem partners first. Dev set me down and picked up Jen. Watch closely. This is our easiest maneuver. He started up the stairs, and Scott picked me up and followed. Wow, I thought, laughing. How far would this joke go? Upstairs, he nudged open a door, carried me over the threshold to a room with two bare single beds, no curtains on salt-encrusted windows. It felt like bravado, a dare we would pretend to have fulfilled, until he pulled the rip cords on my suit. Salty, he said, licking the few spots he had not gotten to before. I wish I could say they blew my mind on something, mushrooms, peyote buds, acid, dropped in my drink while Jen sang, one pill makes you larger, one pill makes you small. <laughs> but I had only drunk two beers, and not even Bruce Brown and the big time could explain why 15 minutes later I lay on a bare mattress with a strange guy's c*** on my belly left there when he thoughtfully pulled out. Was it because I never saw a graceful moment to say no? They never asked me if I wanted to, just assumed, and I went spinelessly along. Embarrassed, I lay by Scott in the glare of afternoon, not talking since there was nothing much to say. Knuckles beat a Morse code on the door, and he wrapped a short white towel around his waist to let in Dev, who also wore a short white towel, like something stolen from a gym. They exchanged shoulder punches with closed fists, and Scott left, not glancing back. Dev didn't look at me either as he dropped the towel and lay down by my side. His eyes were red. Was I really going to do this? I watched myself as we kissed and touched uninspired. He made an effort to comply with the program, and polite girl that I was, so did I but his body wasn't in it, having left its heartfelt efforts next door, and he wilted as soon as he was in. So that was how it felt to be a train. <clears throat> you came to college to find out who you were, right? This was who I was. The rest had cracked and fallen off me by the time I got out of that bed. Naked, not caring who saw, I found a shower, soap, a dirty towel, and did the best I could with them located the Gingham Shift and Henry James, and set off north along the coast highway toward Laguna, away from the big time. The scene felt gritty now as hangover. Smoke clogged the fading sky. Silhouettes of surfers failed to catch subsiding swells. Sunburned beachgoers sat mired in motionless traffic, and I made better time on foot. I passed a carload of Marines, bare chests and buzzed heads, lobster red. Their voices sounded like jeers. Hey, it's a beach bunny, 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 over here. We've got something for you, right here. I might have been a train, but I could still evade. Sandals slipping, slapping, rubbing blisters on my feet, I started to run and ran what felt like eight miles to Laguna. I did not blame Viv and Candy for forgetting me. Even Viv had more principles than me but I had nowhere else to go, and they were the only people I wanted to see. Sweaty, feet starting to bleed, I reached Viv's sandy street. A few yards from the house, I stopped, unsure of my welcome. But it was only a few minutes later when the back door slammed, and there they were, rounding the loquat tree. Viv in her capris, bandeau, and heels, candy in her choir girl clothes. She looked better eyes alight in the way they used to be before Slotkin, and I silently applauded Viv's good work. 
Candy spotted me and called out breathily, Honey, where have you been? Viv held up a child's red plastic beach bucket. Just in time, coming? We all piled into the front seat of the Impala, me so relieved I had to hide tears. Viv drove us fast but carefully to Corona Del Mar, Candy directing her to Slotkin's white stucco bungalow. It sat smack on the street, no yard, a black VW out front with New York plates, still new enough to shine in the reddish sunset light. Its gas cap was ludicrously simple to get off. <laughs> dust to dust, Viv said, erect and ceremonial. She handed the small shovel to Candy. Candy tipped her head and seemed to regard the car with sympathy, like she might balk. But she slowly scooped a shovel full of sand from the bucket, gently poured it in the tank, and passed the tools to me. Solemnly, I did the same and put them in Viv's hand. We went on like that until the sand was gone, the night was dark, and justice had been done. Thank you. <laughs>